Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor of Vision at Holy City Church. I'm glad that you found our online sermon resources, and I pray that the Lord would use them to strengthen your faith. I would exhort you not to use our online sermon resources as a substitute for regular involvement in your own local church. That being said, I pray that our teaching resources would be helpful to you and conform you even more to the image of Christ. James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. I'm going to read ahead through 12 for context. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophet's who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Let's look together now at James 5, verses 7 and 8, and together let's draw out this big idea. Christians are called to suffer with hope-filled patience because Jesus is coming back. We read in the first half of verse 7, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. As James addresses his comments here to his brothers, we see that he is speaking a word of exhortation to fellow Christians. Who are these words given to? These words are being spoken to the church, are being spoken to fellow Christians. We've seen this many, many, many times already in the book of James. James isn't afraid to repeatedly show the nature of Christianity as a community and as a family. One little word repeated over and over shows you very clearly that Christianity is not a one a solo deal it's not a solo sport it's a team sport it's a community sport christianity is a family religion christianity may have separated you from your birth family but christianity is a family religion as james calls his audience brothers sisters hopefully you understand that this isn't excluding you but brothers referring to family, brothers and sisters, James is showing that he sees himself as in a family relationship with them because they too call Jesus Lord. He's not standing over them, requiring them to call him apostle. He's coming to them and saying, you're family, I'm family, because you too, like me, call Jesus Lord. You and I need this regular reminder because you and I live in a world chock full full of temptations to be too busy or too hurt or even too convictional or too frightened to live in close close relationships with other Christians. It's certainly easier to listen to a sermon online or stay home and read the Bible with the kids instead of getting everyone dressed and out the door to gather with the family of God. Parents, can I get an amen? Anybody else tempted this morning to just like stay in your PJs and listen? Man, Submitting to a church body that is larger than our closest friends is risky. Following the leadership of pastors is painful at times. But before you commit to being a Christian without a close relationship with the church, let me ask you this question. If fellow Christians are brothers and sisters, do you think we should be okay with being part of a dysfunctional family? If fellow Christians are brothers and sisters, do you think it's okay to just leave it in all its dysfunction and just hide away from fellow Christians? Do you think Jesus gave us his spirit and adopted us into his family so that we could avoid one another? I don't mean to be snarky or rude, but I simply want to ask a question. Maybe this is for you. Maybe this is for somebody we can't see listening online. Maybe these are questions that you can ask to a friend who's 
having a hard time getting connected to the local church. But if God has adopted us into his family, should we avoid one another? This world, sorry, this, this word, this word of these questions about the family of God will come to some of you and it will be super easy to swallow and you'll think of somebody else because, man, I don't understand why people don't go to church. I love the church, I love the church, I love the church. That's some of you, but that's not all of us. Some of you have endured some seriously awful stuff by the actions of pastors and of deacons and of fellow Christians. These particular kinds of offenses grieve me deeply, and they should grieve all of us deeply, to know that other Christians are at home afraid to join with the church because of something a pastor did or something a Christian did. But if this is you, can I gently and tenderly come alongside of you and ask you a question? Can I encourage you? Would you commit to simply praying that the Lord would help you heal and that the Lord would help you to begin to trust other Christians? Would you pray that God would give you courage to confront and seek the reconciliation that is needed between you and those who've hurt you? Would you pray that God would lead you out of your hiding place and into a body of believers with which you can exercise your spiritual gifts? and receive the blessings of other people's believer, other believers' spiritual gifts? Would you pray that God would guide you to, the lo- to a local church in which you can partake in the Lord's Supper together with your brothers and sisters? Would you begin simply to pray that God would help you to join with those for whom Christ died? Would you pray that this particular church, or the particular church down the road from you, or, or the church you came from, would you pray that churches would be a healthy and safe family that lovingly works through their problems. Would you begin to pray at least? Would you begin to pray to that end? Please, don't get comfortable with a dysfunctional relationship with the church. God is in the business of adopting sinners into His family, and if Christ is our Lord, then each of us has a responsibility to love one another and work to improve the relationships in the church. Brothers and sisters, God has adopted us into his family, and our sin makes it dysfunctional at times. Just me and my wife and my four kids, we got issues sometimes. You put all of us together, that we shouldn't be surprised when there are issues. But if we're not going to be a dysfunctional family, we're going to be a family that strives to unity as God has designed it, then we need to work and we need to pray and ask the Lord's help, knowing that He delights to give help for these kinds of things. James exhorts the family of God to be patient, but this impressive command is set within a context. And that the fact that this command is set within a context is clear because James uses the word therefore. James isn't telling the church without context, to be patient in general. However you perceive patience or however you are living, just be patient. That's not the kind of command that's coming here. James is telling his audience to be patient in the midst of suffering. Verse 7 directly follows a word of warning to the rich in verses 1 through 6. These words of judgment come upon the unbelieving rich in, because of their oppression and extortion of the working class Christians. Verse 4 says that these Christians did work for the rich, but they were defrauded and not paid. They worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. And the person for whom they labored said, yeah, not, you're not getting paid. Verse 6 says that these rich unbelievers were living in luxury, And their luxury was achieved through the crushing of the weak and unresisting Christians. Verse 10 that we will look more closely at next week makes clear that the patience James is commanding is a patience in suffering. As exemplified by the Old Testament prophets who endured great hardships as they obeyed God. The context of this command to be patient is clearly set within a context clearly spoken to a people who are enduring hardship, significant hardship that probably many of us have never had to face. 
Galatians 5 tells us that one of the fruits of the Spirit is patience. And this contented waiting is, will be seen in traffic and checkout lines and delayed packages. But James is here calling his fellow Christians to be patient while they are suffering violence and injustice. This call to wait upon the Lord is given to abused and vulnerable Christians who have endured very real and painful suffering. So I want you to understand that when, when James says, be patient, He's not just saying it to people who are just kind of going through the normal difficulties of life. He's speaking it to people who are going through very serious and acute suffering. This patience is not patience in general. It's patience within suffering. Looking now at James' exhortation to his suffering family, James writes, Be patient until the coming of the Lord. Waiting is hard. And James here calls the church to wait for the Lord to bring justice when Christ returns to judge all people. The same idea was, giving, was given in the warning to the rich back in verse 4 when they were rebuked for having, quote, laid up treasure in the last days. And in verse 5, where their self-indulgent living is expressed as having fattened their hearts in a day of slaughter. This language of the last days and the day of slaughter are referencing the day of judgment in which Jesus will settle accounts with the world. So as James is encouraging the saints to look and to be patient and to wait for the coming of the Lord, as James is warning the rich for their sinful living, reminding them that Jesus will come and will set all things right, This is a very clear and striking awareness that that James wants to bring to their mind that everyone should live in light of this return. James doesn't go into great detail, but just meditating on language like a day of slaughter or a day of the Lord should cause us to think, should cause us to hesitate. How often do you think at some point I'm going to stand before a Lord and give an account for how I lived? How often do you think that the wicked in the world will stand before the Lord Jesus and He will execute justice perfectly? Paul tells us strikingly in 2 Thessalonians 1, Indeed, God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. Listen, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might when He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among all who believed. To a weary and wounded, oppressed and suffering people, James exhorts them to be patient until the day Jesus comes back to judge the living and the dead. He exhorts them to be patient, not in some willy-nilly, someday maybe things will get better. Maybe the next election will bring about a better economy for you Christians. No, he says, wait until the day of the Lord in which Jesus will punish the wicked and Jesus will rescue his people. I think if we're reading this right, we're honest with ourselves, there'll be a certain level of disappointment in this exhortation to be patient. We've already talked about how it's hard to be patient. And James doesn't say, give it another week or two. He says, wait until the Lord returns. Wait until the coming of the Lord. Waiting is often discouraging. Right? That's what makes waiting for something hard, right? I had hoped my problems were going to end today or this week. I had hoped Jesus was going to answer my prayers immediately. 
but he didn't. And now I'm discouraged. We aren't a patient people. We don't wait well, do we? We don't wait well, even if it's only a few minutes for the oven to preheat. Waiting is hard. The original audience that James was writing to, like us, they didn't know when Jesus was coming back. They didn't know when that day was. They'd have been certainly tempted, like, James, any word from on high? Six months? What are we talking? Sixty years? How, how, when is the Lord's day going to come? When is the Lord's return going to be? You can see why there's so much uh, anxiety in the disciples when Jesus is speaking about His second coming. Like, when, Lord? When is that going to be? Because I can wait patiently. Five minutes. Is it going to happen in the next five minutes? Is it going to happen in my lifetime? How long are we going to have to wait? The original audience that James was writing to, like us, didn't know when Jesus was coming back. They didn't know how long they were called to be patient. They didn't have a countdown timer to watch, and neither do we. We know that his return hasn't happened in the first 2,000 years since his ascension into heaven. And if we're honest, the return of Christ seems pretty hard to imagine, let alone expect it. 2,000 years of church history have gone by, and Jesus hasn't returned yet. And now I'm being told I have to wait. I need to be patient until Jesus returns. The command to be patient isn't easy, and it's particularly hard when we don't know how long we have to wait. But James gives the analogy of a patient farmer to illustrate the kind of patient suffering Christians ought to have. We read in the second half of verse 7, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. James doesn't call the bride of Christ to numb or angry or distracted waiting. You hear me? James isn't calling the church to be numb in their waiting. He doesn't call them to be distracted in their waiting. He doesn't call them to be angry in their waiting. When we read these words, see how the farmer waits. We are being called to be excited. We are being called to a confident, expectant, and joyful waiting. Waiting is hard, but James is calling us to look at the farmer who waits. Eager, excited, expectant, joyful, confident that the harvest will come. The farmer knows that God gives the precious fruit of the ground in due time. The farmer knows that important things are taking place out of sight and and he eagerly watches as those things begin to unfold above the dirt. The farmer plants the seed and sees nothing. But he knows that nothing is not happening. He knows that beneath the surface of the dirt, something magical Something awesome, something everyday and normal is happening as that seed is germinating. And then as that becomes up out of the dirt, he can watch slowly as what he planted begins to grow. The farmer's excitement grows as you watch these things unfold out of the dirt. The farmer diligently plants his seed and expectantly prepares for the harvest that will come. With much waiting. Much waiting. Many of us don't know what it's like to plant anything, but some of you have planted peppers, some of you have planted tomatoes, some of you have planted cucumbers, and you know that you put the seeds in the ground and you aren't going to harvest cucumbers tomorrow. It takes time. And you know it, but that waiting process is confident. You put a seed in the ground and God has caused fruit to grow. This is the way it works. The farmer, the hobby farmer, the person living in an apartment with one tomato plant puts a seed in the ground and eagerly waits for that seed to become a plant and for that plant to give fruit. The farmer doesn't grumble about the process but rejoices to know that this waiting isn't forever. And it will be a glorious day when his work and his waiting will be rewarded. 
Do you see how the farmer waits? As the farmer joyfully waits for the precious fruit of the earth, you and I are called to hope-filled patience as we wait for the precious day of Christ's return. As the farmer watches the early and late rains, you and I will hear of wars and rumors of wars. We will watch as nation rises against nation and kingdom against kingdom. We will learn of famines and earthquakes in various places. And we must cling to Jesus' words that these are but the beginning of the birth pains. As we watch the earth and and the church endure great turmoil, we must take comfort from Jesus' promise in Mark 13. Jesus says, but in those days, in those last days that you and I are living in, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory and then He will send out the angels and gather His elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Christ's return is sure. It has been promised. And the suffering and turmoil we experience and see in the world are part of the birth pains. They are part of the growing process. As the farmer watches the necessary rains fall, you and I will watch as these promised tribulations unfold. Our watching is done with patience. Our suffering is done with patience. Our patience is full of Christian hope. Not the hope of the world that crosses its fingers. Let me explain this to you. You live in a world that likes to hope. And likes to use the word hope. But when the scriptures talk about hope, and the way I'm using the word hope is completely different. I sure hope it doesn't rain today. I sure hope we have nice weather. I sure hope that I get a good teacher this fall. I sure hope I don't go bald. I sure hope I find the right guy. On and on and on. I hope, I hope, I hope. I cross my fingers. The Christians speak about hope. It has nothing to do with this crossing of fingers. Christian hope is the confident and assured hope that God will keep His promises. When the Scriptures speak about hope, and as Christians, when we talk about hope, we look forward with confidence. Zero crossing of fingers. Zero hesitation because God has promised and we are waiting for that which we have hoped for. One day, all tears will be wiped away. Nothing to do with me crossing my fingers. Absolute certainty and hope because Christ has promised it. I'm waiting for something that's been promised. This is Christian hope. This is something the world has nothing to compare to. The world has no hope like this. But Christian, when I'm talking about hope-filled patience, I'm not talking about blind optimism. I'm talking about a sure and steady confidence that helps you be patient in the midst of suffering because Jesus has promised to make all things right in his time. Christian hope is not nervous optimism. Christian hope fills our patient suffering with the solid conviction that though we cannot see it, God is keeping his promises. The farmer doesn't plant and hope something grows. The farmer plants and he waits with hope knowing that something will grow. And not something, precisely what he planted. This isn't the first time that James has encouraged this attitude of hope-filled patience in hardship and trials. In chapter 1, verses 2-4, through James writes, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know Is he talking about crossing your fingers? You know, you know, you know, you have confidence that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Be patient or let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect 
and complete, lacking in nothing. Brother, sister, we are called to endure the various trials of life with joy, not because trials are fun, but because like the farmer, we know that these things, these trials, these hardships are productive. So often you are looking at the trials in front of you and you think, I hope something good comes out of this. This is not Christian hope. The Christian looks at the trials he's enduring and he says, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is producing good in me. I know it. And because I know it, there's a joy. The Christian endures hardship not because it's fun. The Christian has joy in trials and sorrows, not because they're easy, but because the Christian knows that these trials are an essential part of our growth. There is no farming without waiting, and there is no growing into Christ-likeness without patient endurance. In chapter 1, verse 12, James writes, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Why? For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Every one of us is tempted to hang it up, give up. I don't want to be in this trial anymore. I want something easier. Why should you be steadfast in the trial? Because when you have stood the test, you will receive the crown of life. There are no crown of life at Walmart. There's none at Target. There's none at Costco. There's none at Sharper Image. You can't get the crown of life anywhere except from Christ and through the process of being steadfast, clinging to His promises in the midst of your trials. Sure. Sure, you could go after sin and get some comfort. Sure, you could let trials and temptations get you sidetracked and go after some comforts. But no sin could ever give you the crown of life. Why should you continue to endure? Why should you count it all joy? Because God has promised a rich reward for those who remain steadfast and trust his promises trials don't feel like blessings but steadfastness in trials is the route we take to receive the crown of life there are many moments in the 24 ish hours of driving back to minnesota to see my parents there are many moments in that long drive where this is not exactly fun But even in those troubling moments, Grandma and Grandpa are at the other end of this road. Grammy and Papa are going to have cookies for us and lawnmower rides and and s'mores like every day. Right, kids? We're going to get there. This road goes there. Brothers and sisters, it's not enjoying the, the journey for the sake of enjoying the journey. It's enjoying the journey because you know where it's taking you. Trials are taking you there. Let me clarify that. Jesus is taking you there through the trial. Brothers and sisters, your difficult singleness, your infertility, your financial difficulties, your unbelieving family members, your health scares, your challenging work situations, your broken friendships, your distant or deceased loved ones, your prolonged illnesses, your unfulfilled dreams, all of them are to be endured with hope-filled patience. And if one day we individually or we as a church are called upon to endure the persecution and the martyrdom that these saints were enduring here in the book of James, 
we will patiently wait upon the Lord, knowing, knowing, knowing with full confidence and assurance that our reward is great in heaven. I want to touch your hurts and apply the gospel directly to them. But if I haven't named your particular hurt, that doesn't mean it doesn't count. The suffering you are enduring as you follow Christ will be worth it in the end. I assure you, according to the promises of God. At the end of verse 8, James says this coming of the Lord is, quote, at hand. Do you see that there in verse 8? Every Christian and every generation of the church has been taught to live as if Christ may come at any moment. Understand that for 2,000 years, the church has been proclaiming the truth of Scripture that Christ and His coming is at hand 2,000 years of church history might tempt us to think that the any momentness of Christ's return is a bit overstated. Maybe at hand or any moment is a little strong. Sometime, future ish. There are many who would even say, those who struggle to trust the scriptures, that would say that the, the apostles were mistaken to think this. But every Christian in every church has been and will continue to be until Christ returns, taught that Christ may come at any moment. This doubting of this promise, this wanting to translate Christ's return as not any moment in this, but someday in the future, that's precisely what the evil one would want us to think. He would want us to live our lives in some level of comfort. Jesus will come back eventually, but probably not in your lifetime precisely what the evil one would want us to think this is precisely what the wicked servants in jesus's parables believed before they were surprised by their lord's return they saw that their master was late in coming the scriptures tell us and so they went about living as if they were lord and then when the lord jesus returned They were filled with deep regret, and the Scriptures tell us that upon His return, these servants were cast out into the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Matthew 3, John the Baptist came preaching, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Mark 1, Jesus came preaching, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. In Romans 13, Paul declares, salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Peter announced in 1 Peter 4, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. The Apostle John records the words of Jesus in Revelation 22, 20. Surely, Jesus says, I am coming soon. To which John exclaims, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The nearness and the at-handness of Christ's return is not some obscure and difficult doctrine. You want to watch people squirm or get excited, start talking about end times or last things. But this particular issue, Christ's imminent return, is not obscure. It's not difficult. It's blatantly obvious. Jesus says, surely I'm coming soon. This is not hard to understand. What do you mean by soon, Jesus? He doesn't answer that question. But it would be wise to believe that when he says soon, he means soon. It's it's sad. It's a sad reality that we live among so many people who run around trying to discern what's the mark of the beast? Who, Who exactly, 
who is this Antichrist? Maybe it's this president or that ruler. And others debate the nature of Jesus' millennial reign. At the same time, they are impatiently suffering and living as if Jesus' return is some sort of complicated puzzle instead of a looming, pending, and imminent reality. Friends, we can think of the end times as something we got to get on a chart or something we need to burn the charts. Right? We can think of the end times as really complicated and what's your millennial position and so on and so forth and what's the role of Israel in the end times and we can get go on and on and on and on and on. All the while living impatiently in our suffering without the clear awareness that Christ is coming soon. And I ought to endure patiently with hope. James calls the church to hope-filled patience in suffering with joyful confidence in Jesus' any-minute return. Before I close and I start to bring this thing down for a landing, soon, right? Before I close, I want to highlight this second exhortation that James gives at the end of verse 8. The Holy Spirit instructs us through James. Understand that this isn't just some preacher, some apostle from a bygone era. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to you and me through the apostle James. And James writes to the church, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Lest we fall into thinking, that our hope-filled patience in suffering is a completely passive thing, we are here challenged to the work of establishing or strengthening our hearts. James's audience was tempted to establish a personal kingdom or to strengthen their earthly situation through taking vengeance on those who had caused their suffering. You see that here, don't you? James's encouragement to be patient for the day of the Lord is an encouragement. Don't give in to the temptation to, to, to exert your vengeance or to start a revolution to get your money back. James is calling them to wait and to not take vengeance. But in the midst of it, instead of starting a revolution or to uh, stir up a rebellion, he calls them to strengthen their hearts. You and I are tempted to establish our careers or strengthen our pleasures in the midst of suffering. We're tempted to impatiently take out our frustrations on others, or to dive into the fetal position of self-pity. To James's original audience and to us, we are hearing a word spoken to people who want to change the world, but James charges them to change their minds. And to strengthen their hearts by faith in Jesus' resurrection and coming kingdom that will finally, finally and fully make all the wrongs righted and will heal all of the wounds. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world of people impatiently suffering and dreaming up their own utopias. And the scriptures clearly tell us there is a coming kingdom in which Christ rules and all the wrongs have been made right. And you need to wait patiently for it, and you need to strengthen your heart as you wait. How might you and I practically heed this command to strengthen our hearts? What, is, what would that look like for, for me to be waiting for the day of the Lord, and not just trying to be patient, and not just trying to have joy in the midst of my trials, but to be actively strengthening, establishing my heart. What would that look like for you and I to heed this command? Let me give three, four things here of what that might look like. Number one, embrace true Christian fellowship. Romans 1, 11, and 12, Paul writes, I long to see you. Why? Why? that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Paul says, I want to be together. I'm sick of writing letters. I'm sick of Zoom prayer meetings. I want to be with you. 
And I want to encourage you and I want to be encouraged by being with you. How can you be strengthened? Gather with the saints. And don't just gather and talk about the World Series or about how much work stinks. But encourage one another. Give strength to one another. Number two, how can we strengthen our hearts as we patiently and confidently wait upon the Lord's return? Regularly meditate on the Scriptures privately and publicly. Some of you love to come hear the Scriptures preached and proclaimed and you struggle to go home and read the Scriptures and meditate on on them yourself. Some of you love to go into your your room by yourself and to read the Scriptures alone, but you struggle to come and hear the Word teach. But Romans 12.2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Brothers, our hearts are strengthened as we embrace Christian fellowship and we regularly meditate and receive the Scriptures privately and publicly. Third, I want to encourage you to strengthen your heart by going to God in prayer. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, listen, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. A strengthened heart is not just something we go and gather through reading the Scriptures, but a strengthened heart is something we go to God and say, give it to me. A strengthened heart is something that God gives. God establishes us, and so we ought to be a people regularly praying that God would establish our hearts. Fourth, lastly, cling to the Gospel instead of new teachings. Hebrews 13, 9 says, Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. Brothers and sisters, as a pastor who watches you suffer and has watched a number of people suffer, there's great temptation for you to look for comfort in something you've not heard before. I need a new teaching. I need a new teacher. I need this hot new book. I need whatever. And the Scriptures say, don't be led away into diverse and strange teachings. It's good for your heart to be strengthened by grace. You don't need something new. You need a new devotion to the old, old story. You need to come back to the glorious grace of Jesus Christ revealed to us in the cross where He bore our sin. Where His resurrection secures our own resurrection. You don't need something new. You need to believe the old, old story. So often, so often, Christians think they need a new book. You just need to reread the old book. Brothers and sisters, the Scriptures call us to suffer with hope-filled patience because Jesus is coming back. How are you suffering? If this is the mark, if this is what we're called to, how are you suffering? In what ways are you suffering specifically? Are you patiently waiting on the Lord's timing? Are you patient in your waiting upon His perfect timing? Is your patience full of that certain hope that the judge of all the earth will do right and will bring a glorious harvest in its due season? Is that how you're enduring hardship? Are you living your life as if Christ might return in His glory at any moment? Are you heeding the scriptural call to strengthen your heart? Or are you forsaking the presence of God in prayer? Are you forsaking the Scriptures and the fellowship of the church? I'm aware that these are words spoken to sufferers and that these are words spoken to a room full of people who are already struggling. And you're hearing these questions and you're thinking... 
Well, add that to the list of things I'm not doing right. You can be deeply discouraged. But friend, we are sitting under the Christian scriptures that say Jesus is a friend of sinners, that Jesus is near to the brokenhearted, that Jesus has come to save a people who desperately need saving. And so let me encourage you, if you're feeling hopeless right now, <laughs> you are primed and ready for Jesus. Oh my goodness, I need somebody to save me. <laughs> let me tell you, Jesus is his name. You need Jesus. And we are happy to tell you about Jesus. And this is where we go for our hope. There, there is much you can do in the midst of your suffering. But let me encourage you that your suffering is to be endured, confident, hopeful, with full assurance that God will bring a harvest and your hardship is not in vain. And God has given us many ways for us to be strengthened in the midst of our waiting. Let's pray.